Captain's log, stardate 4857.9.4. The crew has been scanning constantly for anomalies that might help us shorten our journey home. Ensign Kim has reported an exciting discovery, a subspace disturbance which may be a wormhole. Hello there, welcome back Trekkies, podcast fans and faithful voyagers to a new episode of the Hit or Miss Star Trek podcast in our continuing look at all uh, things Romulan themed. This, uh, I will say up top, is going to be our last episode for a little while uh, in this series. We're having a little break between halves of a season uh, because we are devoting a little bit of time to our other podcast, the Silver Screen podcast. But fear not, we will be back in literally three weeks' time uh, with a review of Star Trek Nemesis, continuing the Romulan theme, so you can still look forward to that. And we'll be back with the second half of the season just a little after that. Uh, so with that out of the way, uh, today we are going to be looking at the Voyager episode, Eye of the Needle, one of the few times the Romulans managed to appear in Voyager. Uh, I am your host, Captain Mike Wilson, as always. Uh, I am not, unfortunately, joined by my loyal first officer, DK. This week, he's off on an away mission or maybe just sick of dealing with Romulans. <laughs> but I do have a returning guest and a new guest with me helping me to break down this episode and do all the usual fun. First of all, please welcome back, Alison. Alison, hi. Hi. Hey, everyone. How are you doing? You okay? Yes, just, you know, lost the whole hour of sleep because of the stupid daylight savings. <laughs> but other than that, oh, and it got really cold overnight. But besides that, I'm great. Wow. Awesome. So, well, not awesome that you're cold, but hopefully you're warmer now and uh, <laughs> slightly more awake. <laughs> I guess. So you're looking forward to talking a bit Voyager? Yes, Voyager, as people might remember, is one of my favorites. So, and I've actually nice. been... Um, I just kind of randomly popped into season four a few weeks ago and I've been just, you know, watching episodes here and there. So it was nice to go back to season one, kind of do like a reverse mm. watch and see how they are four to season one. So, yeah, I love the first. I, I, I know that people criticize the first seasons of all the track shows, but I love the early seasons of Voyager. I'm going to get into it when we get to the review. But yeah, I just I thought it were great. Anyway, uh, we are joined by a first time guest. So please join me in welcoming all the way from Canada. Uh, Justin, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> hey, thanks. It's uh, it's great to be here. I'm excited. <clears throat> you've uh, you've definitely been uh, engaging with us on the sort of social medias with your thoughts on various episodes and stuff. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about Voyager and before that the various other bits and pieces that we'll be talking about. So yay! <laughs> I'm I'm always surprised when you read my reviews. I feel like I I go I go far too into detail. So uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> We're all nerds here, man. There's <laughs> nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, as I say, uh, we were going to do all the usual sections before we get to the review, but that will be coming up later on uh, in the episode. But in case you aren't aware, uh, we always start with a little section of uh, getting to know you, particularly if we have a new guest uh, that I rather geekily like to call Hailing Frequencies Open. Hailing Frequencies Open, sir. <laughs> and so... Uh, this week, Alison, we've uh, we've kind of already had you put on the spot during our Unification 1 and 2 review, so you can kind of sit back and relax for a little bit while we grill someone else. Yeah. Uh, and Justin, as a first-time guest, I uh, I have to put you on the spot and do some Cardassian-style interrogating. <laughs> with there, the there questions are four, like, four. <laughs> <laughs> Correct answer. So, yeah, um, hopefully it's not going to be too painful for you. I think you've probably got all these answers uh, in your head ready to go anyway. Uh, so the first big question that we like to ask all our new guests is, what first got you into Star Trek? Can you remember your first experience or the first episode that really grabbed you and uh, made you a fan? Uh, well, that's uh, it's interesting. My uncle actually took me to see uh, Star Trek VI in theater. Oh, um, cool. and And actually Star Trek V, but I don't really remember that one as much. Uh, but yeah, for the best. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's always been a like I've I've watched TNG since '87. Um, I'm when I was cool. seven years old. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, it's been a lifetime lo lifetime love. Awesome, yeah, same here. But can you remember a specific TNG app that got you gripped or or not? <laughs> 
I was gripped right from a counter at Farpoint. I, ah, loved, nice. I loved right from the start. I, I just sit there wrapped watching it. Um, yeah, that's no, awesome. Cool. Well, related to that, then, if you had to pick three episodes or movies, if you prefer, to show somebody that you think represents the best of the Trek franchise, what would they be? Well, it's funny because I've actually revised this uh, based on an episode you guys did. Um, so oh, okay. The, cool. uh, the, the first Romulan episode there, um, which, of course, now I'm drawing a complete blank on its name. Balance of Terror. Thank you. Balance of Terror. My God, what a good yeah. episode. Um, you know, oh, I yes. watched it ages ago, <laughs> and I did not give it the love it deserved. Um, mm. But now I'm I'm convinced it's probably some of the best writing in Trek. Um, mm-hmm. And then, uh, oh, well, I, I would say that probably, uh, huh? I'm sorry. I have. It's always no. It's always the same when you're on the spot. You, you everything just goes mm-hmm. completely out of your brain. Yeah, you, you go blank. But, uh, uh, take your time. I I, I can I can always edit it, so don't worry. <laughs> So, so Wolf three five nine uh, episode, which is again, I'm drawing ah, blank on the name. Best of both worlds, um, part one and two. The best of both worlds, part one and two. Yeah, I was I was hooked by the Borg. Uh, I like and that. Yeah. That was that was absolutely just amazing to watch with the huge space battle and you know sixty ships destroyed or whatever. It was probably more than that, but yeah. anyway, I think that was the first uh, episode I ever had on video, actually, <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, actually, I have really, really enjoyed uh, the new uh, Strange New Worlds. Um, I, I think that it's yes. a real good balance between old and new. Uh, they've honored a lot of stuff, but they, they're they still trying to move forward. And I couldn't pick a favorite episode, but I would tell you that... Well, you know what? Actually, I take that back. My favorite episode was the Lower Decks crossover. Um, those old scientists. Absolute, cool. <laughs> those old scientists, yeah. Uh, yep. Of course, I, I love Lower Decks as well. Uh, I wouldn't call it my favorite, but... Awesome. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's definitely my favorite Strange New World episode. Those are great choices. Yeah, absolutely great. Uh, let's see if you're equally great than if I ask you this one, which is if you had to sort of pick three favorite characters or characters you can relate to, and there's a lot of them in the franchise, who would you pick? Oh, gosh. This is this is actually a little easier for me. Uh, Picard, um, Data, yep. <laughs> and the Doctor. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. That's some very good choices. And straight out of the bat. Any reasons why? Because two of them are the kind of outsider character that we've talked about before. But Picard, I think, uh, and, and he's on my list as well. So I'm curious to see your reasons as to why as well. Uh, so I grew up with, uh, with, what am I trying to say here? Sorry. I grew up watching Picard on, on TV and just thinking mm. like, this is the most moral, upstanding, amazing person. Yeah. And if I do anything in my life, I want to be like him, you know, yes, yeah. and uh, <laughs> with uh, with data, it was absolutely I so identified with him as a as a child. I've always been pretty analytical, um, hard time dealing with people. Uh, and it was so much like watching myself up there, especially when it came to his curiosity. Um, mm. I've always been a very curious person. And the doctor, uh, well, I've always been moved by his humanity. <laughs> It's funny mm. oh, we'll is. be talking about the Doctor when we get to the episode review because there's a decent subplot uh, involving Voyager's Doctor, yeah, for sure. So One of my favourites, yeah, Awesome stuff. Yeah, I, likewise, I, I always forget it's part of this episode and then when I went to rewatch it, I was like, oh, I remember the subplot being just as good as the A plot in this. But uh, yeah, we'll get there anyway. So yeah, that's good choices and great reasoning. I can't, uh, can't argue with you there. Um, so yeah, this is the last question, so that you can relax after this a little bit. Well, not really, because we're going to go straight into the other sections. But uh, yeah, so the last question for now is, um, since we're dealing with all things Romulan-themed, do you have any particular favorite Romulan characters or storylines or anything that you wanted to shout out? Oh, gosh. Uh, my favorite treatment of the Romulans has been Lower Decks. Uh, we're going to go lurk over here now, you know. Uh, that's uh... <laughs> it's, yeah. it's actually one of... The Romulans are one of my biggest... Uh, pet peeves about Trek is the their aliens are so one dimensional, you know. Um, oh, I wish DK was here. You're agreeing with everything he's been saying. <laughs> and uh, it's it's you know we've there's a few episodes here we've watched now like Balance of Terror uh, that was a very different Romulan, um, and mm-hmm. it was nice to, it's a uh, nice to see. Uh, and then actually in this one you see a, a more human Romulan as well or not human sorry more I don't know I know what you mean though more relatable yeah. uh, you know three-dimensional character although that's, that's yeah, the word i'm looking again, for 
it's yeah. it's nice we'll to get into it but can, i yeah <laughs> they can write them as being like you know more of a a, a varied species instead of a one type of like because i don't know look at earth it's nothing like that here right so yeah <laughs> Yeah, there are some great episodes that do that, and some of them we'll be dealing with in the second half of the season uh, as, as well going forward. But I, mean, I, I can understand your frustrations, and like I said, it's my co-host. Uh, if he was here, would t- certainly be clapping because he's been saying that the whole time, and he also loves the lower decks thing. He often quotes Mariners, the Romulans are just shady. <laughs> so he's uh, yeah, very <laughs> fond of that as well. So, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I can't say fairer than, uh, than that. So that concludes uh, the questioning for, for that anyway, for the Healing Frequencies Open. So, uh, I'm going to jump straight into the next section. So, Alison, you, you're going to be called on again after that okay. little brief respite. Alrighty, I'm ready. Uh, so, <laughs> can't let you relax for too long. So, uh, this will be the section that I call the hit or miss section. Bum, bum, bum. Uh, what about my performance? I'm not a drama critic. So yeah, this is the section that gives the podcast its name. Uh, if you're not familiar with what we do, basically, um, I pick some things, just any random things from anywhere in the now expansive Star Trek uh, franchise universe, and uh, throw it up on screen if you happen to be on YouTube, uh, shout it out to our guests uh, who have no idea what's coming, they're not told in advance, uh, and I ask if they think these things are a hit or a miss, a little bit of reasoning why, we debate back and forth if there's any disagreement between us, and we try and come to a consensus at the end of it. So... Uh, is that all clear for you guys then, yeah? Yes, I, I think, think I understand. I think I got it, yep. Awesome. Uh, so, uh, I've got five things today. If we can get to them, we'll see how we do for time. Uh, but I have five ready and prepped. So, uh, And as I should have said, uh, we will do some things that fit in the theme of the ongoing series. So there will be some Romulan-themed things in there, uh, but not all because I don't want to just overload the entire thing with just Romulan-themed things. I might get a bit boring. So, yeah, there'll be a couple that crop up, but it won't uh, overwhelm the section. Uh, so the first thing on the list for today is not Romulan-themed, uh, though it does relate to uh, something that you mentioned just not that long ago, Justin. So it's a character, uh, a character specifically from Lower Decks. So hit or miss for the character of Andrithio Billups. And uh, Justin, you're the guest. I'll come to you first on this one, the new guest. Oh, man. Like, an absolute hit. This guy is amazing. Um, just, uh, yeah, the whole the whole story about him, his, his background, I, I, I love him. <laughs> cool. Uh, Allison, any thoughts? Um, I would say he's not my favorite on the show, uh, but I do think he is a hit. I would like to see more of him, um, but I do know it is about the lower deck, so we might not <laughs> see too much yeah. about him. But um, he, his backstory is is great; it's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, um, and yeah, I, I, I can't really add to that except to say, yeah, if you haven't seen that one episode which deals with his backstory, where he's from a kind of medieval times-esque planet which is you know all uh all their ships look ornate and they you know they the call dragon's their vocal dragon's breath, breath and stuff <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah and uh yeah but related to that is the whole idea that you know he, he his mom is the ruler of the planet and she's trying to make him basically have populate <laughs> have <sex. laughs> so that she can sort of uh you know take his place on the throne for whatever reason that's part of their thing and he just he seems completely uninterested in uh, in any of that business. In, right, in which one lady wonder, and it's the warp core. Uh, it makes me wonder <laughs> if, if he's like a representation for the asexual, aromantic spectrum, which I love. Oh, very know? possibly, yeah. Yeah. Very possibly, because certainly uh, when the, I think it's in the episode uh, I Excretus, when they go to the Mirror Universe simulation and he's the exact opposite, he's just the kinkiest member of the group. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. So I funny, but Mirror yeah. Universe. I just, Mirror Universe is where I hit. <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, I, I love uh, Paul Shear, the actor who does uh, the voice for this character. I love that, like uh, like you said, Justin, the idea that he's just like, he, he's so obsessed with the warp core and doesn't see any problem with that. He's unashamedly sort of a nerd for engineering, which is a and perfect uh, sort of partnership. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Too. Yeah. But it's great when you pair him up with Rutherford, who kind of has that same thing, um, and, and their kind of mentor-mentee relationship I kind of like as well. So I'm going to have to agree and it, say hit. So. <laughs> think of it as a bromance myself, but but yeah. More of a bromance, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> 
yeah, I can't disagree with you on that one. So, I mean, yeah, that's uh, no disagreement there. Then that's uh, three hits for uh, for Lieutenant Andy Billups or Andrithio, as he's brilliantly called. <laughs> which I love. <laughs> I love lower decks just uh, you know having normal sounding names, and then you find out their full name, and it's some weird futuristic, bizarre language sounding thing like Bradwood Boimler and Samantha and Rutherford. <laughs> it's such a dumb joke, but it gets me every time. So uh, we're going to move to the second thing on the list. The second one, surprising nobody, is a ship, because everyone who knows me knows I'm obsessed with ships. Uh, and it is hitting the Romulan theme. Uh, it only appeared in one episode, so I'm going to put a picture up, and you, you may not recognize it. It may jog some memories. We'll see. Uh, so hit or miss for the Romulan shuttle. Uh, and I know for a fact it appeared in the episode In the Pale Moonlight. I'm not sure if it did beyond that. Uh, and uh, Alison, we'll come to you first. We'll switch it up. What do you think of this ship? And can you even remember it? Um, I do not remember it. But as we know, people, I tend to go by aesthetics, and mm. it looks like um, like a bird helmet. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it actually gives me Star Wars vibes. Um, oh, okay, you get the I, Mandalorian helmet. Yeah, on the front, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I never noticed that, but it absolutely is. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna say hit. I like it. I dig how it looks. Cool. Okay. Uh, so, Justin, what about you? What do you think? Oh, well, I mean, it's a baby Derridex class, right? Um, little, little, <laughs> little Romulan Warbird. Um, it hasn't grown up yet. Uh, <laughs> it's yeah. interesting to see the shuttle uh, architecture um, and the mirrors, everything else they got going on. Uh, but uh, yeah, I like Romulan ships. They're always kind of cool looking. Awesome. So you're saying hit as well, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> it's a hit, yep. Awesome. I have to agree. Um, we'd seen other Romulan shuttles in Next Gen and stuff, which were kind of a little more boring, no offense. I think you like them, but they were just kind of flat uh, looking things. And uh, so when this appeared in DS9, I was like, this is more like it, because exactly like you said, Justin, it's it's a baby to Derek class. It looks like you've taken a Romulan Warbird and made a smaller, compact version of it into a shuttle. So there's less sort of dead space and everything, but you've got all of the the extended wings and the little beak thing at the front, and it fits the Romulan aesthetic. And I just thought, when I first saw this on DS9, it looks really cool. I hope we see it again. We never did, as far as I know. <laughs> it briefly appeared in this one episode, but it's a, it's a ship I would love to own, because, I, again, I go mainly off aesthetics in these situations as well, and I'd love to have a little model of it, but I don't think they ever got round to doing a model on, uh, on the Eagle Moss collection, or if they did, I certainly didn't get it. <laughs> Maybe I'll have a look online after this now that I've jogged my own memory, but I think it's really cool. So. <laughs> Oh, well, uh, so yeah, that's uh, the second thing is another hit. So we'll see if we can keep the, uh, you know, the, the love fest going, I guess. Uh, the third thing I have on the list is an unusual thing. Um, it's kind of a species, I suppose, character. Uh, hit or miss for the Horta from Star Trek, the original series. That picture was ridiculous. I'm sorry. <laughs> but hopefully you know what I'm referring to. Uh, Justin, do you need me to fill you in on the Horta or are you aware enough? Uh, to, to, no, to no I'm... It's been a little bit for me. Oh, that's fine. Um, yeah, uh, the Horta is from Star Trek, the original series, and it's basically the the episode The Devil in the Dark, which is really popular. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a bunch of miners who are getting killed, basically, on this planet, and it turns out to have been this life form, which is not like anything you've seen before. It's basically, it looks like it's made out of rocks and lava, and it is a silicon-based life form, so it's not like anything we would recognize. And so the miners have been kind of killing its babies without knowing. Oh, yeah, that's it's been right. been laying these eggs, and it basically has, you know, been just protecting its babies from them and stuff. And Spock right. does a big mind meld with it to sort of realize what it I does. I remember it now. I think there you go. <laughs> it's definitely a hit for me. I like episodes okay. like that um, when... I feel like they're a good representation of learning about differences amongst ourselves and species and in humanity. Um, mm. And I mean, anything with Spock is cool, but in mind melding. Yeah. But um, yeah, I I really I remember that one as soon as you said that about protecting its babies, um, because we always yeah. go to the worst case scenario, like this thing is out to get us when, you know, we have these. Um, we have these primal primitive instincts and that one's instinct was to protect its children, you know, which any species would do. And that's something that connects them and unites them. So I'm going to say hit. Awesome. Uh, cool. Justin, what about you? Uh, so I, I uh, on, on design, I'm going to go a bit of a miss. It looks like. A yeah. Product. The special effects, unfortunately, weren't quite up to just something quite so unusual. <laughs> but yeah. but uh, 
but yeah, that that being said, the the themes that you're talking about, an absolute hit, of course. Uh, how do you how do you not say that? I mean, honestly, silicon based life, uh, protecting its kids, uh, yeah, classic track for yeah. sure. Yeah, I would agree though. It's yeah, it's definitely missing in regards to its design. It would be yeah. neat to see it re um, re examined or re explored in a new reimagined. Yeah, yeah reimagined. That's the word. Thank you. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I mean, I I don't always say that they could do with updating some of the TOS designs because some of them I think are perfect as they are, and you can go a little bit too far. But the Hortus one that I was like, we could probably do something good in CGI, <laughs> maybe that would look better than whatever this is. But I appreciate what they were trying at least. Yeah, oh, absolutely. For the time, I mean, what could they have done really? Right? What about yeah. the rock in there? You know, like it would be so yeah. cool to be able to go back during that time and watch one of these episodes and like observe people and how how they reacted because this i mean this is like the first kind you know kind of thing for that time so i can imagine it was for us i mean we grew up with better special effects so well, it is kind yeah. of um hokey or you know a little cheesy looking um for but sure. i can imagine growing up as a kid or even an adult watching this it was probably just fascinating <laughs> yeah well, i mean i don't hate it you can see what they were going for is that the whole point is that it looks like it could be just disguised as a bit of rock or something that you would not think twice about and it's a life form that's so vividly different that the, you know that's that's where the kind of crux of the episode comes from that's the conflict um but i i agree with both of you that that's the beautiful part of, of star trek in general is that you have this thing that is so different to us and that's what we're here for seek out new life etc so you know they come to that understanding and they realize the creature isn't some malicious monster it's a mother protecting its children and mind meld with it and everything and uh even you know dr mccoy healing it and then that great line i'm beginning to think i could cure a rainy day once he's <laughs> sort of fixed it all up <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i love it hey great at episode. least it's not a at least it's not a dog with like daily boppers on its head <laughs> oh that dog that poor dog where they just stuck yeah daily boppers and like a unicorn horn to an actual little poor dog oh terrible yeah let's not talk about that one but yeah no Horta, fantastic such a cool sci-fi idea and uh you know the original series just starting as star trek meant to go on with some brilliant ideas i think so yeah we're doing really far too well people are going to just be like put something out that we can disagree with <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll see um so the next you thing having <laughs> real fans on the show man like uh, they're all going to be like it's great it's star trek <laughs> oh, well yeah you say that we've had our disagreements in in uh, the odd bit uh, of episodes of, of, of you know various things but we'll see the next thing is an episode it is romulan themed uh, and I may have to jog your memory on this because I'll be honest, it's not one that sticks in my mind all that much. It's just it's come up a couple of times and I was curious to include it. Uh, so hit or miss, the Star Trek Deep Space Nine Season 7 episode, Inter Arma Enum Silent Legacy. So, wow, that's all. Okay. That's, say that three times fast, you know? Yes. Oh, that's Latin for in times of war, the laws fall silent. Apparently is a quote from Cicero. And I only know that because it tells you that in the episode. <laughs> so there you go. So yeah, this is the season seven episode where basically uh, Bashir is on a mission to Romulus uh, and they find out that Section 31 are basically trying to manipulate things behind the scenes and, you know, there's all kinds of political dodginess going on, the Dominion Wars in full flow. So yeah, that's right. I can't really give much more away without big spoilers, which I don't really want to do, but uh, if you don't remember it, that's fair enough. Like I said, I can only vaguely remember bits and pieces of it myself. Uh, so, Justin, we'll come to you first. What do you think of this episode, if you can recall it? Yeah, so I, I can to a point, um, and I would mm. actually call it a, a, a rare miss in DS9, uh, for sure. Oh, okay. Um, wow. it, it's uh, section, for the, section 31 is so anti what Trek is about. Uh, mm. you know, a lot of them, I really just don't appreciate the episodes. Um, so yeah. There's a couple of them I, I would say that I do, um, but uh, nothing in this one made me too excited it's not terrible but it just wasn't great yeah fair enough uh, so what about you allison <laughs> is this the one where we find out he was like recruited by them or they wanted to recruit him oh this is well after that this is like okay. a season after that <laughs> so... okay is this the one where they um they like take him and he winds up there or something he doesn't go on his own right 
No, no, he's he's on a mission. They're on an intrepid class starship, which is you know they're okay. just using the Voyager sets, and they're on a mission to Romulus, and then he finds out that Sloan is kind of on the same mission, essentially in disguise as just a regular sort of Federation okay. diplomat, but he knows that Sloan is Section Thirty One, and it's more kind of Bashir trying to oppose them without, you know, letting slip that the Federation has this touchy yes. organization, so that the Romulans can be like, "You're spying on us. What's going on?" So it's kind of a it's kind of a political. Yeah. We don't do anything like that. <laughs> yes, nine is very political. I mean, I like yeah. I love that about it. The show. Um, I feel like it's very relatable to our world right now. I mean, it was back then as well. But dang, the stuff's going on now. But um, I am gonna say a miss. Also, um, I like Bashir, but not so much the episodes that are more so Bashir focused. Um. And I kind of agree with the section 31 stuff. It is kind of like the, it's so weird that there's a section of of that in Star Trek because it is, it's kind of the complete opposite of what they're supposed to stand for. And maybe it's to show us that nothing is 100% good. There's always this kind of gray area. Maybe that's what it's for. I don't know, but um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's the two classes of Star Trek fans, right? Ones that believe in a utopia, and and then ones that go, "That's impossible." Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, or we're needed to make utopia as much as utopia can be. Yeah, and there are people that think you know it's just an entitlement, whereas you know they don't appreciate a lot of the time it's about working for that and having to you know keep it going and stuff. So. Yeah, I think that there's a place for for that kind of thing where that things can have fallen apart. Um, but yeah, in terms of this episode, weirdly enough, I'm going to go very soft hit because I also agree with everything you said about Section 31. I think there's no real place for it in Star Trek. I hate the idea of it in terms of what the, you know the Federation having this thing. Um, but in the terms of this particular episode, I like that it actually is one of the rare times that it pushes back against that, and Bashir really calls out all of their you know that they're crap basically and says you know we cannot become a you know this fascist state where just because we're at war we can do whatever we like and it's been interesting as a response to certainly if you look at the episode in the pale moonlight um which i think it, it, it you know it's not a direct response to that it's purely coincidental but in my head it's kind of an interesting you know bashir versus cisco debate i guess so i'm gonna <laughs> go soft hit on that one excuse me but i certainly can't excuse me can't but disagree with you guys on that one so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to put that down as a miss for the consensus view two against one. <laughs> so uh, we'll leave in the Romulans then for the last thing. And again, we're going back to two things we've dealt with before. Firstly, lower decks. And secondly, it's me. So of course ships. Uh, so, <laughs> so finally hit or miss for the starship USS Archimedes, the Obena class. So there it is on screen. Uh, Justin, we'll come to you first. Do you, what do you think of this? Uh, yeah, I, so it's a classic Trek design hit, I guess. I mean, somebody might want to mess with the plumbing. And I don't know, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's I, I actually don't know. Did this design come off of the uh, of the ship from uh, Star Trek Three? Um, uh, it's based on. I mean, you can see that the influence of the Excelsior. Uh, which I know that what you're referring to there. Um, so it does have a bit of that. And a lot of people thought that that was basically what it was. But you can see, if you're a nerd like me, you can see the differences in the regard of there's more decks on the saucer, so it's a bit thicker. Um, the deflector dish and the nacelles are sovereign class. So the Enterprise E, basically, uh, are inspired yeah, no, more by that. that early. I see it now. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not a I'm not a know every ship guy. Sorry, but uh, <laughs> that's OK. That's fine. <laughs> uh, it's it, it's very reminiscent. Right. And uh, oh, yeah. I mean, it's just classic design for Starfleet. They uh, they, they all look similar, um, mm -hmm. you know, even even the, the very strange ones, like you get into like the steam runner class and stuff. Right. So. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's a hit, I guess. Cool. Fair enough. Uh, what about you then, Allison? <laughs> Nope, it's a miss. Oh, I why? I don't like I don't I don't like the aesthetic at all. I don't like that like the the badonka donk at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't like the Excelsior class generally then, I guess. No, I don't <laughs> like that big like it reminds me of the top of a Dalek. 
with a little eyeball. Oh yeah, I guess yeah. I can see what you yeah. mean. It's, it's a, quite a fat drive section, and it's uh, yeah. It's yeah, I don't like that, bone. and I also don't like what is that a nacelle on the back? It has the yeah sovereign class nacelles. Uh, yeah, I don't like that either. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I don't like it. It's a it's a miss for me. Fair enough. Uh, well, I'll I'll be the tiebreaker, and in this in instance, I will uh, go the other way. I see hit. Uh, for me, because I, I just like it. I'm, I'm a ship nerd, as I said, and I like that they, they kind of, I, I always love when they pay homage to something that's gone before. So the idea that it was basically, it's based around the Excelsior class, but it has the modern updates to make it bigger and, you know, presumably more powerful. And I love the Sovereign class nacelles personally, even though I'm not a huge fan of that ship. I think the nacelles look cool. And I, yeah, it's, it's like, it's a cross between two ships. I love the Excelsior and the Sovereign class. So it was a hit for me. Uh, and I believe, if I'm remembering the episode correctly, that it was captained by Sonia Gomez, who I love <laughs> from uh, Next Gen as well. So yes, because I just for that. googled it, and that is correct. Oh, okay, cool. It was on Lower Decks. Yes. Yes, did. it was the season. It was one of the season finales, season three, maybe. Um, but yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, yeah, maybe season two. Anyway. Irrelevant, but yeah, so I, I'm going to say a hit, and so, yeah, you're outnumbered two to one on that one, Alison, I'm afraid. That's cool, that's cool. So, uh, yeah, but that's fine, I, I gave you guys the episode as a miss, so there we go. Uh, right, so with that out of the way, then we're going to uh, jump into the actual bulk of the episode, which is going to be uh, the review of the Voyager episode, Eye of the Needle, as I mentioned. Uh, before we start, though, um, I have been doing this thing this season, prompted by Adrienne, so blame her, and... Uh, homaged, certainly not ripped off, but homaged from uh, the Delta Flyers podcast, where I'm coming up, uh, I'm doing it single-handedly because Adrienne's not here, so I'm coming up with a limerick and a haiku to represent the episode, and I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna call, uh, I'll read one of them now and one of them at the end of the review, so I'm going to ask my two guests here, which would you prefer first, limerick or haiku? <laughs> um, Haiku. Okay. Well, I'll have to say, haiku sounds pretty classy, so. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, my traditional haiku. Not particularly exciting, but uh, it, it's hard to stay within the five, seven, five syllables rule. Uh, my haiku to try and uh, encapsulate Eye of the Needle. <clears throat> a tiny wormhole. A Romulan beamed aboard. A blast from the past. <laughs> there we go. I Hopefully like simple it. but effective. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. My limerick's better, but I'll get to that at the end. <laughs> if I do say so myself. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, um, before I jump into the behind the scenes things and hopefully don't bore people too much reading all of that out, I always like to start by asking if you can remember the first time you saw the episode and what your initial impressions of it were. Uh, so, Justin, do you recall when you first saw this and did you like it at the time? Um, you know, I actually do recall. Um, I, cool. I loved watching Voyager. And, uh, you know, so the first season, I, there's lots of parts I loved and lots of parts I had problems with. Um, mm. And one of the things I, I really liked about this episode was uh, the, the subplot with the Doctor. Um, mm. But I thought it was far too early in the season for them to be like, oh, hey, we might get home. So this seemed like far more of a uh, like end of season episode. Um, right. Even in a two-parter, right? But uh, So I remember at the time thinking like, oh, yeah, a wormhole, sure, they're going to get home, right? Yeah, so, you know, like... <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, I, I hear what you're saying, and I think there's at least one bit of audience feedback that says the same thing. I, I'm, I'm in disagreement, you know, uh, politely with that, because I think what the episode does do, like, we, we, are, we know we're not getting home, basically. And what it does for me is emphasizes, for the first time, really, how kind of lost they are and how desperate the crew is and the kind of the actual stakes of it. Because when they're actually stranded during Caretaker, it's very much like it's, you know, one minute at the end of an episode where they go, we'll be fine. We might find a wormhole or a way home and we're stuck here, but yay, we're going to go and plug on. And so this is the first time we've really dealt with, no, these guys are lost. They are ages away. And we actually have Harry Kim saying, you know, my parents, even though it's not been that long, will be devastated that I'm lost and not know what's gone on. And may they might think we've been killed or destroyed. And see, I, I appreciated the fact that we really saw the, the emotional impact it has on the crew being lost for the very first time, rather than just mission, 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 and we're not thinking about it. Um, so I think it serves kind of that function quite well. I see what you're saying though, like in terms of in terms of the actual mystery, it, it's not really one because you know that they're not going to get back home. You know, six, eight episodes, whatever it is, into the yeah. show. Well, that was a really <laughs> great run, six episodes. It was good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> so yeah, um, but yeah, like hopefully, like yeah, a sitcom, right? That's... <laughs> Yeah, well, one series worth of a British sitcom at least, but yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I certainly see both sides of it, but hopefully you can understand where I'm coming from in terms of like oh, the effect the plot I, had. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I have the uh, benefit of years of experience now, um, and yeah. I, I, I see a lot of what you're saying. Although I do think it would have been better, even even if it wasn't the final episode, just somewhere closer to the end of the season. Yeah, and I mean to be fair to your point, they do do basically the same thing that I'm seeing better in season four when they've been lost longer, when they find the Iranian hunters. And it's like, we might finally get letters home and we're going to deal with being separated. And so in that regard, this ends up a little bit redundant, but I do think it was nice to have it early on to really establish your stakes as opposed to, because, you know, <laughs> as a as a viewer at the time, particularly as well, I was very much like, well, it's no different than any other Star Trek show. They're on their ship, they're doing their missions and what's the difference? And then this really emphasized like, no, no, they're, they're devastated <laughs> to be stuck here, you know? So anyway, <laughs> so what about you, Alison? Can you remember the first time you saw it? No, I do not. <laughs> I mean, okay. I, remember, I remember when I was watching, like around the year and all that. But I don't. I mean, and I, I obviously I remember the episode, and then because I, I rewatched it last night and I remembered stuff, but um, I don't have the specifics, and I don't remember um, what I thought of it back then. But um, okay. I like hearing both of your points of view because I I get but what both of you are saying. Mm -hmm. I um. I tend to more so lean on, I guess, the, um, I don't know how to say it, not the, like, mechanical, technical aspect of it, of, like, obviously, they're not going to go home. They're not going to be able to, like, we know that. I mean, it's, like, six or seventh episode in or whatever, but, yeah. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of, I think, moments for character development, like, you see, um, you know, Kess and her like quest for knowledge and, and mm. development, you see the doctor and especially because like I said earlier, I've been doing season four. So then to remember how he was back then. And the doctor is one of my favorite of all time. So, cool. you know, just remembering how he was treated in the beginning. And it's like the beginning of um, Janeway, you know, giving him some autonomy and he, oh, yeah. he asked for his name, you know, so you've got that stuff going on. Um, you're seeing now I will say one thought that kept popping in my head is, you know, for him to have never gotten like moved or promoted up past Ensign, Harry Kim has a lot of responsibilities on that ship. You know, <laughs> I always said that that was part of the joke, isn't it? Is that the poor guy? I mean, when you get to season four, he's basically core responsible for giving them the astrometrics lab. Yeah. That's, you know, so in instrumental. I mean, granted, you know, seven of nine was instrumental as well, but he helped. Yeah. <laughs> and they're still yeah. just like, nah, you're fine I mean, where you are, Ensign. Right, if, I know. If Voyager had gone on merit-based promotion, they all would have been captain by the time they got back. This is true, yeah. yeah. But I feel I, like I, he had done enough where he could have moved up a couple of notches. I know? wouldn't mind it as much if it wasn't for the fact that I get rubbed up the wrong way by the fact that Paris gets demoted in yeah. season five. And then mm -hmm. at the end of season six, they're like, you've, you've done so exemplary, we're going to re-promote you. And I'm like, get out of here. What's he done that Tim hasn't right. done? Right, exactly. <laughs> Like that was so emphasized, but then it's like not even really considered for for Harry. Um, yeah, at least yeah. Harry did call it out in that episode though when he was out. Like, didn't see a little box on my chair. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but I love the temporal stuff, you know, the temporal displacements and um, mm -hmm. any kind of, you know, they go back in time or any kind of past related stuff. Those are some of my favorite episodes. So oh, when sure. when Tuvok is like, oh, look, and he. he he does great voice for Tuvok, but um, uh, Tim Russ, I remembered his name. Yay. Um, Yay. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but yeah, when he's like, you know, he is, what is the year captain, you know, what year is like, this? Yeah, exactly. and even though I remembered that, that, that was going to happen, I was like, Ooh, and I'm eating popcorn. Cause I was literally eating popcorn, you know? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah cool. So <laughs> I, uh, I do, I really like the, I like this episode. I feel like yeah. it's that, that season one nostalgia of Voyager. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Because you can see how they, they grow as, as they go on, for sure. So seeing them in the early days, is it's kind of nostalgic in its own way, for sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, to, to, to piggyback off what you were saying, I will say as much as 
I don't think it's redundant in the regard that we know they're not going to get back home. And I actually think it's very cleverly handled as to the how and why they can't use the wormhole. Um, even if, you know, some people might say it's a bit tiresome that it's just one problem after another. Because, But I like the way it kind of unfolds this thing of like, there's a wormhole. Nope, it's far too small. But we might be able to beam through it. Nope, can't do that either. We might be able to communicate through it. Nope, can't do that. <laughs> oh, it turns out it's a Romulan ship. Oh, crap, it's an enemy of ours. What are we going to do? Okay, we're going to try and talk to him and then talk him around. And it's like, oh, turns out it's also from the past. So we can't do that either. So it's a, it, it's a kind of a series of uh, too many punches when you're down type situation. But I did appreciate that, you know, at least it made sense. And it was, it was not just a question of... Uh, you know, oh, there's a wormhole now; it's gone, or whatever. Some kind of silly, sort of quick reason as to why they couldn't use it. So, but yeah. isn't that kind um, of um, um, a reflection of how how it is for them the entire series? Like they're they're constantly oh, yeah. punched, but they I mean, they make a they still keep going. They still it's that human spirit or whatever that perseverance. Yeah, for sure. That, absolutely, and it falls in the why are they even searching for a wormhole in the first place? They only know of two that have like a constant opening on them. Mm -hmm. um, Right. So, well, yeah. 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 But it was one of the things they kind of said. And you, you kind of, I appreciate what they, they were going for with that. Um, and like I said, I, I think for me, it's, it kind of emphasizes how exasperated they were, you know, to get home and, and without them seeming unprofessional, the, seeing the kind of hopes built up and dashed each time, I think really emphasized the, the devastation. And at the end of it, you really feel, you know, how browbeaten Janeway must be when she's like, well, Guess we can just carry on then, because uh, not really much else we can do, you know. I thought uh, that was a good moment, like her facial. Oh yeah. You know, like you see, she's on the verge of crying, um, and I like that about her as a captain. She doesn't hold yeah. back her emotions; it makes her stronger. But she's not like overly. Um, they don't impact her in a negative way, which I think, as a society, we think women can't be leaders because we're we tend to be more emotional than men. Um, you know, that's the argument of the millennia or whatever. Um, but to me, she's just, she's an, a great example of a leader and her compassion and her emotions, um, uh, make her a better leader. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, fair enough. Uh, well, if you're listening on the Federation Self Space, we're going to have a quick break now, uh, on YouTube, we'll probably just throw in a, a trailer for our other podcast, uh, but yeah, stick around. We'll be back and we'll start breaking down the episode with the behind the scenes information. Action! We're the Silver Screen Podcast. Hey there, film buffs. I'm DK, your cult movie uber geek, and I'm here with my co-host, Mike Wilson. That's right, folks. We're your guides through the world of cinema, from beloved classics to the hottest films in the zeitgeist. On the Silver Screen Podcast, we dive deep into film culture. Join us as we review movies with honesty and respect, offering our unique take on what makes them tick. And don't forget our Silver Screen Cult Classics episodes. We'll take you on a journey through the hidden gems, the cult films that deserve more love, and the stories behind them. We've a blast welcoming all manner of movie-loving guests for lively discussion and to share our love of films. Their passion and knowledge make every episode a cinematic adventure. Plus, we'll give you our own scores straight from the heart out of five stars. You'll hear our honest verdict no matter how much we geek out about a film. And remember what Arnie said, we'll be back. So don't miss a single episode of the Silver Screen Podcast. Subscribe now to the Silver Screen Podcast YouTube channel or find us wherever you get your podcasts. Let's embark on a cinematic journey like no other. Whether you're a casual moviegoer or a true cinephile, the Silver Screen Podcast is your ticket to film magic. And, and cut. cut. Welcome back, Trek fans. So yeah, we are breaking down the Voyager episode Eye of the Needle and our continuing look at all things Romulan themed because there is a Romulan in this episode. Uh, so yeah, I have a hopefully uh, not particularly too boring behind the scenes section to read out. Uh, I'll read it and uh, hopefully it'll be, you know, some things that you haven't heard before or might be interesting. That's fine. Analysis. But, uh, yeah, despite the producers having decided not to feature any Alpha Quadrant species or characters too often on Voyager, Jerry Taylor made an exception with this episode. Obviously, the Romulans. Uh, one decision that was made by committee was not to show crew members composing the messages that the Romulan had promised to convey to their families, uh, and Jerry Taylor recalled it was certainly something we talked about, but we decided that to leave it unspoken might be more powerful. As I said earlier, we kind of saw in the episode Hunters them doing that anyway, so yeah. 
Uh, the episode's shooting script likens the wormhole in this episode to the Bajoran wormhole in Star Trek DS9. The scene description of the wormhole when its interior is first shown on Voyager's view screen reads, The screen swirls with gaseous energy, but a watered-down kind of energy. It lacks the dynamism and majesty of the DS9 wormhole. Instead of brilliant electric colours, it's a sickly yellow-brown, as though it's withered, slowed, and dying. Uh, mm. Speaking about her experience of writing the episode, Jerry Taylor noted, I love writing people shows and the building of this arc between Janeway and this Romulan commander. What began with his complete doubt, skepticism and weariness, all those Romulan things, in a sense, by long distance that built into a relationship and closeness and almost a friendship. The idea that by the end he was almost our champion was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Yeah, uh, I like that. Yeah. For sure. Uh, and again, an interesting... Uh, you know, extra dimension to a Romulan character for once. Definitely, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. nice to see. Now, do we feel like that <laughs> is more so the writing or the actor? I think both. Both have a part to play. I mean, if an actor couldn't have delivered on it, yeah, it they, have, have, they have to give them the space for sure. Um, <clears throat> but, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, anyway, Voyager's writing staff initially planned for the episode to introduce viewers of the series to the concept of a hollow novel, which was new for Voyager, and for the series to thereafter frequently revisit the concept. To this end, Jerry Taylor devised a Wild West hollow program for Janeway, intended to be a part of the episode's teaser. Uh, the Western scenario was subsequently discarded, but the concept of having the teaser serve as an introduction to Janeway's hollow novel remained. During the writing of the shooting strip, the holographic scenario was changed to being a gothic mystery which will spark a few memories for people. So yeah, the teaser would have been set in a drawing room of the mid 19th century. This scene was filmed, but in the long run, virtually everyone wanted to abandon the idea. Uh, one reason why the teaser was changed to a shipboard scene was due to Rick Berman finding it more exciting than the originally planned hollow novel one. But the Gothic scene later became the majority of the teaser of the later first season episode, Cathexis, with slight changes from the version in this episode shooting script. So, yes, we did eventually see Janeway's Gothic hollow novel, I think more than once in the early first season. Excuse me. Uh, the episode script called for only two sets to be used besides those of Voyager. These two sets were the environment of Janeway's hollow novel, which was cut, and the Romulan bridge, the latter of which evidently utilized modified design elements, such as Ramor's chair and a graphic to one side of it, that had previously been used for past Romulan episodes, such as The Next Generation's Face of the Enemy. As so few sets were needed, this episode was, in effect, a bottle show. So yeah, one of those money-saving things they often do. I kind of thought that as I watched it. It didn't seem like a lot of... Uh, you know, expenses that would have been needed. Um, oh, it's, it's funny because I, I actually this is something I've been saying for a while. It's what New Trek is missing. Um, some of these episodes yeah. are really great, you know, and they, they have the space to explore themes and, you know, or it's not all action and what have you. Uh, and yeah, yeah it's, it's nice to see. For sure. Bottle episodes and what people call filler episodes and stuff. I don't like that term because I think sometimes they're necessary. Uh, and yeah, I've said that for a while. I agree with you. I think we, we miss those in, in sort of 10 to 12 episode seasons. There's no room, uh, which, you know, I lament the loss of it. But uh, anyway. Um, well, in uh, fairness, some of them are terrible for sure. Uh, you know, oh, but... yeah. I mean, there's some for every, you know, terrible one, though, you've got something like the episode Lower Decks, which I've said before a few times. I've championed that a long way and said you'd never get an episode like Lower Decks, for example, in Star Trek Discovery because it doesn't deal with any of the main credited characters. But oh, can you imagine how much more effective it would be if all of those named bridge characters that we never learned anything about had an episode like Lower Decks for them? Well, but no could room. you imagine TNG without episodes like Measure of a Man? You know, like, in, mm. you know, that's a total bottle episode, but very classic Trek and just amazing, uh, you know, a theme of, like, rights uh, about sentient beings. Oh, completely, yeah. <clears throat> completely, and I think uh, the closest we've had to that maybe recently is Ad Astra Per Aspera from uh, Strange New Worlds, which mm -hmm. I've long said I absolutely adore, but I mean, you could call that a bottle show, really. It's it's a courtroom episode like Measure of a Man. It all takes place in that one set, so... But yeah, there's definitely a place for it, for sure. Um, metaphorically referring to the function that Talek Ramor serves in the story, uh, Michael Piller opined the mysterious voice on the other end of the telephone line is always a great hook. Uh, Piller was pleased with the, the way this episode depicts the Romulans in contrast with how they've been used on TNG, as we've already said. He explained it worked very well for this show. We've always sort of used Romulans as stock villains in a World War II way. I always felt the Romulans were the Germans and the Klingons the Japanese. This was much more multi-dimensional. 
Okay. Uh, the shooting company had become tired and casually playful, and regular calls for quietness on the stage were ignored by director Winrick Colby, uh, just like the other members of the shooting company. Uh, he was not at all upset that the police for quiet had gone unheeded, as he knew that the others on the set were fatigued and needed a break from the tension. Uh, but Rick Berman paid an unexpected rare visit to the set when the shooting company was filming on stage eight, the scene involving Telek in one of Voyager's transporter rooms. Moments later, during shooting of the reaction to Tuvok's revelation that Talek Ramor was transported from 20 years in the past, Chakotay actor Robert Beltran turned to Tuvok actor Tim Russ and in a loud manner innocently asked, does that mean we're fucked? Following a split second of silence, everyone on the set burst out laughing, including Berman. (laughs) I had to include that anecdote, I just love it. Oh man. There we go. Uh, This is the first of four episodes in which at least one flesh and blood Romulan makes an appearance. Uh, The season three episode Unity features a Romulan former Borg named Aurum. Season four's Message in a Bottle involved a group of Romulan hijackers led by Rakar and Navala attempting to seize the advanced Starfleet ship USS Prometheus. And the fifth season episode Infinite Regress includes an assimilated unnamed Romulan. Uh, Furthermore, the season seven two-parter Flesh and Blood includes three sentient holographic Romulans, while the episode Q2, also in the seventh season, includes an unnamed holographic Romulan tip. So there you go. Surprising how many times they turned up in Voyager for a Delta Quadrant based show. So, yeah. Uh, cool. So any thoughts from you guys on any of the B- BTS stuff? I think, uh, so going back to the beginning of what you were saying, I was really actually, I think the cuts were, were pretty good. Um, mm. It wouldn't have made a lot of sense with people not really knowing the characters to have them writing these letters. They wouldn't have meant anything to anybody. Where yeah. leaving it off screen, yeah, it, it hits way harder. Um, For sure, and, and I think you achieve the same thing with the scene between Harry and Balana that you wouldn't necessarily have done there, which I absolutely adore that scene because it sums up both those characters so well that Harry is kind of like the overprotective parents. They'd already be worried and he's just wants to get home and maybe he's been a little bit coddled, I don't know. Uh, and then Balana on the complete opposite side, who's like, I really don't care one way or another, everybody that I know that's a friend of mine is on the ship so there's nobody waiting for me so meh <laughs> so, yeah yeah it made, it made Milana quite a sad character actually uh when you when you look back at it i i remember sort of watching that just uh, yesterday when i watched this again and going oh yeah i forgot how sad her story started out <laughs> yeah i, I kind of love that though the Bellana i always find relatable in terms of like an uh, allegory for depression and things like that so it's mm-hmm. kind of it, it started off here but like i love the episode um, extreme risk when she finds out like anyone else that she did have that was a friend in the alpha quadrant has now been wiped out by the dominion so yeah it's like, oh crap yeah. <laughs> you know poor woman anyone she'd ever <laughs> get about is just gone at this point um but yeah it's also interesting that uh, it's the first time that reveals that she kind of has this frosty relationship with her klingon mother uh and you know doesn't speak to her father or he's not around for whatever reason so because I read somewhere that Roxanne Dawson had it in her head canon that it was her father who was Klingon and her mother was human, and she was intrigued to find out it was the other way around. So I was like, ah, interesting, cool. Hmm. Um, right. Uh, I'm going to jump into the writing and the plot, but before I do that, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, Alison, because you <laughs> mentioned earlier that you'd done a little bit of research into the guest star of this episode. So to save me having to go over it, what I've written, I'm going to ask you to fill in the audience about uh, about the guest star here. Well, we have two guest stars, but our That's biggest it. one is Telek Ramor. Is that how you say his mm-hmm. name? That's right, yeah. Um, he is played by none other than Vaughn Armstrong. Mm-hmm. And does anyone know who that is? I mean, I do, but <laughs> I know you do. I'll, I'll throw it open to Justin to see if he knows. I, I, I found out this morning when I was reading about this episode. Um. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> so um, he is only one of five actors to play seven or more different characters in the franchise. He played 12 separate characters in 28 episodes over four separate series. He's best known for Admiral Maxwell Forrest, which was... Yeah, Enterprise. Yeah, (laughs) Enterprise. Um, And there was an episode on DS9. And then he was the first male Klingon, other than Worf, on TNG. Mm. So, yeah. So that would be Vaughn Armstrong. And, um, yeah, I definitely think he added to that character. 
Oh, for sure. Right. He's a great actor. Yeah. Yeah, he really is. Um, and then the other guest star is um, his name is Tom Virtue. He played Walter Baxter, and he only yeah. did a couple of things, but he played Walter Baxter in two episodes um, in that first season. Uh, I have the needle and twisted. And then in the seventh season, he played a Corin supervisor oh. in Workforce and Workforce Part Two. Ah, oh, cool, interesting. Yeah. And no, he didn't play it. He was mentioned in the thirty sevens. Ah, okay, cool. I didn't know that either. <laughs> See, I don't like Janeway, that character enough. <laughs> Janeway thought that he was one of the ones that would stay. Um, oh, okay. Fair enough. Yeah, um, I don't like him in this episode because he, well, you're not supposed to. He's kind of the bigot character who's yeah not addressing the doctor and, uh, you know, oh, is he going to do an operation? I don't know about that. And uh, Yeah, so he's kind of your foil, I suppose, in, in the B-plot. Um, he's but, you know, had some not straight the end, though. He oh, completely, yeah. Straight. And I love the doctor, the way he stands up for himself in, the, in those scenes. So even when he says, I'd have to think about that, and the doctor's like, well, let's hope you wouldn't bleed to death in the meantime while you're giving it some thought, you know? <laughs> I love him. Oh my gosh. He's oh, I love Robert Picardo. I yeah, he's I love that character. I am um, Absolutely. Yeah. I, that's, it, that's was, <laughs> it was nice to watch a first season episode to see how far it had come because I always think of it as the sort of end of the series where yeah. he's a valued member of the crew and everybody treats him well. But you, you can forget that the stuff like this was going on, right? So Right, definitely. That's why oh, I sure, like, yeah. um, I don't know if any either one of you have ever done this, but I did it with Buffy the Vampire Slayer years ago. I did a reverse watch through where I started oh, with cool. season seven and I worked my way back. Wow. And that it's really, <laughs> huh? That must have been weird. <laughs> it is, but it's really interesting. Like kind of how I'm saying now how I've been watching season four and then I rewatched this last night for this um, episode. And I like doing that, and I really I think I'm going to eventually do that with the different Star Treks because hmm. you you forget, like you're saying, you know, like you forget how they were at the beginning. So you really um, like when I did it with Buffy, for instance. I saw a lot of how there had been some foreshadowing, you know, like hmm. with Willow and her her being a lesbian and, oh, and things sure. like yeah. that. The magic. But, yeah. um, you pick up on little things like that that are planted little seeds and Easter eggs and stuff that you don't necessarily maybe notice when you watch it in the chronological order. So, um, and you see the character development differently. It's um, if you want a perfect series, by the way, to do that with, which plants Easter eggs, which you wouldn't expect, but plants Easter eggs from the start, which all get paid off later on. I recommend doing it with Futurama. If you happen oh, to be a fan. I love <laughs> Futurama. I still need to watch that new season. Newer. Yeah, it was good. I'm with you. I, I like the B plot as well, since since that's what we were dealing with. I think uh, it's interesting to me that yeah, you see Janeway coming to her realization of, of what the Doctor means and, and how important he is to the crew. And it's interesting that at the very first sort of time that it gets addressed by Kess, that, that uh, Captain Janeway says, well, I've heard the opposite side, that his bedside manner is terrible. And we've been talking about reprogramming him. And that's so like shocking to us to hear mm -hmm. now. But hearing her saying that just so blase in this first season is just like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's, it's like you said, though, that shows how far we we came in the seven years, you know? It's a bit it strange, honestly, how they treat this subject in Star Trek, though, because you think about Moriarty in, in TNG mm -hmm. and gaining sentience. Mm -hmm. uh, you think you'd be a little more careful around the holograms just in case they might, you know, get upset with you. <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, he he does explain the doctor like you know he's he's very limited. He's confined to sick bay, and if anybody tells him you know to, to just deactivate, he can do it. So it's not like he's he's not really in a position to do them any real harm. Not that he would anyway. He's a, you know he's a physician. He's done the whole Hippocratic oath thing. But yeah, right, but I mean, didn't Moriarty find a loophole, and that's how he wound up. Yeah. Well, it was more that that, that was more of a thing where you know they said computer make an opponent who can defeat data and then the computer magically, you know, made this whole yeah. um, super self-aware and indestructible and whatever else. So self-aware yeah. sentient hologram that could take over the ship. Oh, goody. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Cause you know, the computers I'm sure would just be that stupid. <laughs> yeah, whatever. But so, no, hey, it's the whole garbage in garbage out, man. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> look, we were just following what you told us to do. You said pick you someone who can be very specific. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. It reminds me of, because um, 
again, I've been doing season four. I just saw that episode where um, the doctor goes over to this ship with another. Um, oh, I love that episode with the. Uh, yeah, and he. Real and Dawson, you know, great actor. He really yeah. tries to kind of mentor this um, this other, you know. Yeah, but the hologram's uh, fully insane. He's like, we are the higher form of life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. for him to see, you know, that kind of other side of that and how him being treated so poorly um, has fe- affected, you know, that hologram psyche and everything. It's really Absolutely. Cool. But I, I see the Doctor storyline, particularly in, in episodes like this one. I see it as basically being almost a copy, but that sounds reductive, of like what they did with data in Next Generation. So like you brought it up already, but if you look at like the measure of a man, this is basically a a small microcosm version of that, of like, oh, just because he's a hologram, he don't got rights, you know? (laughs) Right, yeah. Well, I guess if we're paralleling it to like the world, would it be like like people saying certain... um, classes or certain races are right. lesser than and how oh, completely people, yeah. you know that whole yeah. discussion it it puts it in a that's the great thing about sci-fi stuff it lets you have those difficult conversations um in a more covert way <laughs> yeah. especially and with I mean, people who don't do well just having straight up conversations oh yeah well stuff. you've kind of yeah some, sometimes people don't understand allegory because they don't want to but i mean certainly <laughs> both next generation in that episode and voyager in future episodes would literally compare these things without rights to slaves you know like oh <laughs> they're lesser so we've got like data who we could you know picards like the threat is that they would just make a race of datas that would be disposable you know doing jobs we don't want to do <laughs> and then of course the doctor finds out in season seven of voyager that the emh mark one that's how regarded it was so it's currently just all the other versions of him are off doing you know mining work that's dangerous and nobody wants to do somewhere because you know, they're yeah, just which, enslaved as, as less. <laughs> right. It raises some very interesting questions then about those holograms. Like, are they leading lives that have become independent? Do they have the same sort of impetus the doctor did to become sentient? You know, mm-hmm. um, it's uh, and actually another modern parallel uh, is, is what we're currently doing with AI, uh, which raises mm-hmm. a lot of ethical questions. Um, you yeah. Know, and. I don't, people have a lot of opinions on it, of course, but, uh, and uh, I'm not saying for one second that they're sentient, but, uh, no, of course, but I, I do see that as a possible future. And how are we going to handle that? Yeah. Right. See that, and I love, I love speculative science fiction that asks that mm-hmm. question. Um, without getting too far off of Star Trek, there's a British TV show called, uh, Humans, which had, I think, yes. four short reasons. I know reasons. what you're talking about. Um, which basically asks that question. It's like these, they create robot people who are intended to be basically the equivalent of like an iPhone, like an appliance that you just buy for your house and they become the, your maid, your babysitter, your sexual partner, if you like, whatever. But these things are so advanced that they're sentient and they don't want to do this. So it becomes this whole question of like, what rights do they have? Are we right to keep them enslaved? Is this a programming error? Is this actual thought and consciousness? And I love oh, that Star Trek will occasionally ask those those big ass questions as well, you know? With the doctor, it makes sense that he would have some, you know, personality and what have you. But with a minor, you probably could just, you know, lobotomize him essentially because he doesn't really need to do much more than mine. I suppose, um, but that does beg the question of like at that point, is that is it fair to do that, or if they have the potential to become as sentient as the doctor, mm-hmm. then was it right uh, morally to have done that to them? You've you've sort of stopped them from ever having a chance to to grow um, or to become more. <laughs> It, it, it raises the question of why you would use them for that in the first place. Like it would be exactly. a lot easier yeah. just to make a mining hologram. Um, well, precisely, but... exactly. <clears throat> but like so... I said, it's more regarded as well. It's a dangerous situation, and we don't want to go in there. And you are not flesh and blood, so you matter less. So just go and do what we tell you. So <laughs> yeah, it sucks, but yeah, it's a it's it's a weird one because I mean. The Doctor as a character always fascinated me because he, this claim that like the EMHs aren't necessarily sentient at first and whatever else, but they have to be fully programmed like Doctors and stuff. So there's got to be, I mean, there's a level of intelligence and care and everything involved in that that's like, I, I personally don't see that you could get from just programming. So, but yeah. Yeah, no, I, a, I think it, for sure it comes with the, the you life experience you've been running for this long, you start to realize what things mean. Um, mm-hmm. It's just if you're programmed to be a doctor and you only ever came out every 20 minutes when there was an emergency, that you would never ever get that, right? So yeah, precisely. Yeah. 
Cool. Well, yeah. So that, I mean, that was the B plot of the episode. Uh, I think quite thoroughly dealt with, and uh, yeah, we all we all loved it because we love when Star Trek asks these questions, and particularly when it comes down on the side of no, no, every, just because somebody's different doesn't mean we don't have to treat them with respect and rights. And uh, like I said, I love that Jamie comes to that realization, and she finally says to the Doctor. We, we can get somebody to work on it and give you control over whether or not you're deactivated or, or switched on. And, you know, you're you're now a valued member of the crew. You don't have the luxury of just being an emergency stopgap. So, you know. So on, on this, I'm sorry, I do need one more point here. I actually tell my kids to be nice to uh, to Amazon, Siri, or sorry, no, uh, Alexa, <laughs> yeah. and Siri. And, like, all of them, like, it's not that I think that they deserve our, you know, utmost respect, but this is a habit you should probably get into because they might soon. Yeah, there's another, again, we mentioned uh, Sonia Gomez earlier, but there's that great moment in um, Q Who, when she does that, she asks the replicator for hot chocolate and then says thank you, and Geordie's like, why are you thanking the replicator? And she says something like, what's well, listed as intelligence circuitry, so why not? What am I going to do, you know? So, yeah, I see what you're well, Being polite is always a good thing anyway, right? I mean, well, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, you, if you're sitting there screaming at this thing, ah, I hate you, blah, blah, it's like, that that'll spill over into your life so maybe just try to be nice <laughs> well yeah <laughs> words to live by in a lot of ways i think but yeah cool it's like um, uh, the doctor says on doctor who if you if, if something like if you can be anything be kind like yeah absolutely. it's not hard to be kind well maybe it always is. try to be nice but never fail to be kind yeah. So I've got a few bits and pieces just about the plot and the writing of this episode that I wanted to read out, which again, hopefully are, you know, interesting. Um, uh, as Starfleet doesn't learn of Voyager's circumstances until season four's message in a bottle, it's clear that Starfleet never did receive the crew's letters from Telic Ramor, which I find fascinating. Um, Torres surmises at the end of this episode that in spite of Ramor's death prior to 2371, he may have passed Voyager's chip onto the Romulan government and... Interestingly, in the season seven episode Inside Man, Reg Barkley comments that the Romulans, quote, have always been interested in Voyager, which may well be as a result of having studied the chip that Ramor passed on to them and not mm. telling the Federation, which I find fascinating because just throw away little lines, but it gives you so much uh, rich, you know, world building just based on this episode. And I'd, I'd love to believe that. <laughs> he was like, Romulan government, give this message. And they were just like, nope, but we're fascinated about what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, headcanon, of course, I, I see that uh, or, sorry, Tuvok would have absolutely made them replicate a 20-year-old chip to give them that message on. But they don't say that in the episode. You know, like... Good point. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's it's interesting. There's a lot of implications with time travel that, uh, as I've gotten older and thought about it more, uh, makes it harder to watch some of these episodes. Mm. Um, whereas when I first yeah. watched them as a younger person, it was just easy to accept. I don't really mind things like that so much. Sometimes I do with these episodes, but in this case, it's kind of because there's not that much of a gap in years. Like it's only twenty years. My biggest issue is that they don't they don't spend longer debating why not just beam back to that point because it, you just get one throw with Anna Paris going, "You'd be a kid, don't do it." And then I'm like, there really is more of a debate to be had here because it's kind of like, well, you can either go back and just wait twenty years and then resume your life, or spend seventy years stuck here trying to get home. So. That bugs me a little bit that they didn't sort of think, well, maybe, you know. Um, but again, I think that's another reason why this has to be an early episode, because they haven't sort of like, we've got no other way. We've given up all hope of finding anything else. So it's more believable that they'd be like, well, I'll leave it. We can't do it, <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah. What did you guys think about that? Were you not bothered by that at all? Uh, it, you know, what bothered me a lot in this episode when I watched it now was that, you know, Get Telecom more here. Who's this, this Romulan scientist? What did the government do to him when he came back? I mean, he saw their ship. He walked around it. You know, yeah, like I, the Romulans have always been portrayed as this. Well, we'll do what we have to uh, to get the information we want, um, and that includes their own citizens. So, like, it raises a lot of questions about the after that. Get kind of gets kind of dark when you think about it. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's something I hadn't considered because it's one of those things where. I mean, Junwei even says it's not like the intrepid class is classified. So, mm -hmm. yeah, really about the Romulans learning about it. But I love that that's little hints like that before you've seen the conclusion of the episode. When you know what the conclusion is and you're rewatching it, it, it adds so much more depth when you're like, when he's saying things like, I don't recognize this design of ship. And, and then you realize, mm -hmm. as well, it's 20 years in the past. Of course he doesn't. Right. <laughs> so. Or this technology is, um, you guys are making history or, you know, things like that. Um, and they're just kind of like, 
okay why is he so excited about this you know <laughs> yeah absolutely although i think uh, somebody somewhere in in something i was reading did point out that it's uh, it's also in that period where next generation says that the romulans hadn't had contact with the federation of starfleet in like i don't know 70 years or whatever it was because it was before the next gen episode the neutral zone mm -hmm. um yeah. given that it was 20 years before and i was like actually that's a point they really should have made a bigger deal out of that when telegramo was like we've not had contact with you at all in but <laughs> they just kind of shrug it off you know? that's uh, I, I hadn't even thought about that but that's a really good point um yeah which yeah the interest in what he saw and what they did would have even been more intense <laughs> absolutely because this this is literally the first time that they'd seen a federation ship in whatever many years or any of them had so as you say it, it begs a lot of uh fan fiction -y related questions about what happened to him going yeah. back but again i think that's just kind of i feel for the writers because it's just the presumably it was an arbitrary choice to make it 20 years and yet it just raises more questions than it answers to be honest um, uh, 20 years is long enough that you know that he's definitely in the past but it's it's not so long that it's very noticeable yeah right uh, yeah. if, if it had been 70 years in the past, his uniform would have been different. The ship would have been entirely different. You know, like the the carrier that they talked to them on would have been different. You know, so like. Absolutely. Yeah. But I think contrary on the other side of that, sorry, I should say they can't make it shorter either, because if you make it 10 years, then it makes it even less common sense that they wouldn't just go, well, let's just be more. Yeah, <laughs> just absolutely. wait 10 years. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Well, you, you start wondering about things like cryostasis, uh, you know, why wouldn't they just yeah. go do that for 20 years? But, you know, yeah. it's. The Romulans, of course, probably would have taken them all into custody and never let them see the light of day again. So, <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. But again, that's something they really should have addressed when they were like, "Can we beam aboard your ship?" And and he's like, "The Romulans would never allow it." And again, that, that really is a place where you should mention we haven't even contacted or had anything to do with you for decades. So why mm -hmm. would we? But again, I guess that would get confusing for non-fans, and it would be a whole mess of stuff to get into. But yeah, anyway. Um, but no, I do love that the way this kind of mystery plays out, that it leaves those little hints about the time displacement and everything that, that before you actually get that big reveal from Tuvok so yeah I, I like that part of it anyway so um so yeah anything from the writing or the plot that you guys wanted to bring up before I jump into any slight notes that I have uh the only mm. the only thing I thought was the themes uh, that you know that still resonate about sentience and AI and such and then uh nice to see some not one-dimensional Romulans uh, I think, but I thought mm. that uh, Telek Ramor was written very well. He's he's very mm. relatable, um, you know. And Janeway leans on him a little bit of the guilt there. Uh, well, what are you know? You have a family, right? Like, uh, oh, I kind of love know what this like. If you want to have something relatable, then I think that's the best way to do it is to emphasize the family thing. So I kind of love that, Janeway. Oh, I absolutely. Say it as as such, it's more like you know, you you are an uh, you know, for one of a better word. You're a human being like us, even though it's not. You know what I mean, though? You're a kind of thinking, feeling life form like us, so you can relate to how we must feel. You know? So Absolutely. triggers the you know, it's, it's, a, it's a manipulation in a good way. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Because, I mean, I, I will say I got really annoyed at, at first by how kind of he, he starts off as the traditional kind of Romulan distrustful. Yeah. Sorry, it should be hard for a scientist to look at the data and go, Oh, yeah, no, everything says they're in the Delta Quadrant. I kind of have to believe it, right? Yeah, like, that's what I think. <clears throat> like, if it wouldn't have been a science vessel and a science individual, I think they probably would have yeah. had more difficulties. But um... but again, though, having said that to your point, Justin, in terms of how interested with Romulans would be, like, he didn't say he was going to keep any of what happened classified, and he's just beamed across 70,000 light years in 20 years. They aren't going to be interested in this. That's an well, epic that's, thing you've done, you know. <laughs> another thing I thought about after the episode, like, what did the Romulans do with that wormhole? You know, yeah, they had precisely. To it, and it wasn't going to go away at any time soon. I think um, they had implied that it was collapsing, so it wouldn't have been around for very much longer. But even but, still, they could have made that clear. <laughs> well, you know, like, how long has it been collapsing for? Is it going to collapse in a yeah. week? You know, absolutely, they didn't. They didn't uh, emphasize any of that. And you yeah. know what would the Romulans do with like? I kind of like that they didn't. Like that. I kind of like that they didn't tell us because I think in life, like let's say the three of us are on a Voyager ship, you know, um, we wouldn't know. Like we would be, oh. we would be at the oh, wormhole. Yeah. It didn't work. We'd move on and leave yeah. it behind us. Um, so oh, in that sense. Um, the episode kind of plays out like it it does for Voyager. 
Uh, so I'm going to move to the, the next section, which will be the acting. And again, I have a couple of little things to read out just because it relates to, you know, things that we probably would agree with anyway. Uh, so first of all, you've obviously talked uh, already, Alison, about uh, Vaughn Armstrong. Uh, he talked about his role in this episode and remembered I played a pretty popular character. Uh, that was a very nice character to portray because of the conflict he had within himself. Uh, I love that character. And he cited his role here as one of the richest of all of his Trek roles. Uh, further commenting, Ramor holds a soft spot in my heart because he's from a kind of mean race that still had great family values. He loved his children and that was a binding factor that I enjoyed about the character. So yeah, I think we basically already said that was something we we appreciated the family connection and that he had a bit more dimension to him than you know just mean Romulan guy. Um, I'm gonna go lurk over here. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> I'm being shady, but yeah. So um, <laughs> we've already talked about this as well. But the director Winrick Cobb thought the episode involved good character development for Harry Kim uh, and stated, as far as characters are concerned, that was a good showcase for Kim because he was ready to go home. I thought it was a good challenge for Garrett Wong, and he rose to the occasion. Uh, and Wong himself reflected, I had a good time on that, and it was a good story. I thought there were some good levels in that one that I hit, which I would agree with. Uh, and. Janeway actress Kate Mulgrew implied that this was one of numerous episodes she enjoyed because it featured heightened tension and emotions among the regular characters due to an alien confrontation, thereby exhibiting unusual elements of Voyager's senior staff. In this case, Mulgrew said there was a marvellous revealing of the Doctor. He needed to feel he was a part of the crew, and I loved my moments with him in that show, which, again, I could not agree more with. I loved those moments, I think, Absolutely. beautifully acted by both uh, parties in that one. So, And, again, I've kind of talked about all of this, so uh, I'm... Just going to say, yeah, Garrett Wong uh, and uh, Roxanne Dawson in their scene, fantastic. Love Kate Mulgrew and Robert Picardo, both separately and together in the episode. Um, and yeah, Vaughn Armstrong is a great guest star. So that's all I really have to say on the acting. Uh, but what about you two? You know, Robert Picardo, I, you know, he just, um, he, <laughs> he's just amazing. Uh, he just does, uh, that, that character was just made for him. And Kess, I just, um, mm. I really enjoy her. And I remember the first time watching Voyager, I was sad when she left. Obviously, Jerry Ryan came right in and 709 is great. Um, yeah. But hopping back and seeing Kess, especially with Kess and the Doctor, um, you know, it, it makes me miss that. Yeah, so I, I got to agree with what you said about uh, uh, Kate Mulgrew. Like her, her portrayal of Captain Janeway was just excellent. Uh, and you know she she throughout the series is just a, a absolutely great expressive actor uh, at mm -hmm. uh, conveying emotion without even saying anything, uh, and also not conveying emotion. Um, you know, in moments when you want, might expect someone would. Um, mm. she, she she plays a cold character many times when she has to, even though you could tell it's tearing her apart inside, which you know again speaks to her acting. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and Robert Picardo, absolutely. Uh, his portrayal of the Doctor has always been excellent, in my opinion. Uh, mm -hmm. He he definitely plays with it. Um, so again, throughout the series, but even in this episode, when he when he admonishes the guy, sort of in a snide comment, but you know doesn't really <laughs> do it to his face. But then at the episode end of the episode, he's like, "Hey, I'm the chief medical officer, and I will report you to your boss." You know, like yeah. uh, it, it's uh, excellent character development. Um, and yeah. uh, certainly fun to see the Doctor being played that way. Um, yeah, cool. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, we've mentioned a lot of things about the acting in that, and just fantastic. I, I would second everything that you've said and that I said at the start, and, yeah, Kate Mulgrew in particular, I think, is probably my MVP because she's just so good. I mean, she she's not afraid to be excited at all of the prospects and possibilities and, and kind of show that to the crew, which I, I appreciated. Uh, especially, you know, from the start of the series when she, there's even a part in one of the early episodes where she says like, oh, a captain would normally have more of a distance from her crew, but we we are going to be stuck here, so we kind of have to be more warm to each other. And I, I, I get that dynamic. I love that. I love that she, you know, it, it hurts all the more when she realizes that it can't work. And as you said, that little moment at the end of, we better get going, we've got a long way to go. It's just devastating and... Yeah. Um, I also want to shout out, this is the first time uh, that I can remember anyway, uh, really seeing the bond start between um, Paris and Kim. So with Paris' suggestion of like, I say we name this the Harry Kim wormhole. <laughs> was really a sweet moment. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, the next section then would be the direction, which I have to say I have nothing on really because... We've kind of already talked about it in terms of, you know, the acting performances, the way they were directed. Winrick Colby is a, you know, a talented director. He directed Caretaker and Phage prior to this, uh, you know, and, and I 
didn't really spot anything, you know, very flashy or, or whatever in terms of the direction, just to say that it was very competent and I appreciated it. Uh, was there anything that stood out to either of you? Mm, nothing really stood out to me. Um, no. Yeah, no. <laughs> I wrote the guy's <laughs> name down, but that was really about it. Yeah, I was the same. And I, I mean, I appreciate a lot of it, but we'd be here all day if I just start talking about the things like, this shot was great, but you see it a lot in TV, and he did this year and this year. But I'm not a director, so I can't get too technical. And again, it was good. <laughs> like a lot of the space shots are just their stock shots and stuff. Um, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. So what what can you really say? I and mean, it's a bottle episode. So what what is the direction on a bottle episode? It's it's you know, hey, make sure we get the right faces in the screen. Um, yeah. You know, there's, yeah. like there's no action for him to make sure it's on the screen or anything else. But it was very well done. Um, the the whole episode is easy to watch. There's nothing in it that makes you go, oh, that's not right. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. And I think sometimes the fact that nothing egregiously stands out is actually a, a you know, credit to the director. Because if you notice something overly flashy or, or too in your face, then they're not in service of the story. So I think it's kind of a compliment. See, I didn't really notice the director's stamp on this because that means they did their job. You know, so yeah. very competently. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Uh, so the the next thing then is uh, just a VFX production design. I have two very small notes on this, but I was curious if you guys had anything you wanted to bring up. Um, I think for the the time frame it was created, that wormhole was pretty cool. Mm, agreed. Yeah, yeah, that's a great visual effect, and I can see what they were going with, with in terms of the making it look withered and dying compared to the Bajoran wormhole. Yeah. 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 Definitely. It definitely portrayed that. I I, I hadn't read that that uh, part. Uh, but I definitely, I, once you said it, I was like, oh yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. it was clear that it was dying. <clears throat> yeah. I haven't, I haven't written this, but I love the, um, when you see the kind of probe go through as well, the visuals of what it looks like inside of there. I mean, even though they're not super advanced or anything, it's kind of, it's a nice visual to put you in its place and see these green flashing swirly bits and whatever. And, uh, yeah, just kind of cool. Um, Actually, on the on the probe there, um, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think microprobes have been used in any other episode. Not that I recall, but um, yeah, because it would have to be tiny, thirty centimeters. Didn't they say that was the uh, the aperture of the wormhole? So <laughs> really, yeah, it's going to have to be one of in technology, right? Like, holy <laughs> cow, they can send carrier waves for transporters through it, and you know, like it's a conduit for communication, and it can take all these readings on the world. Like, holy cow. <laughs> what yeah, what I mean, does a normal the, probe have? <laughs> you know? It's kind of it's kind of for want of a better word, it is logical though, because I mean if you look at the way we miniaturize technology even today, I mean compare a cell phone of the nineteen eighties to a modern day, you know, mobile phone or whatever, and it's incredible how much smaller it is sometimes. And uh, maybe maybe the probes were made in space Japan. <laughs> yeah. honest, well, it's, it's like I said, it really begs the question of what can a larger probe do? You know, like, holy yeah, like, why, why even use the larger ones in that case? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it still does get stuck, though, to be fair. In the <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the, the last thing before we get to, uh, you know, uh, our bits and pieces, uh, favorite characters, etc., and bits and pieces like that, would be the music and sound of the episode. Uh, and again, if, you, if you'll let me, I do have one thing to read out about this, which is that the music for the episode was composed by longtime Trek composer Dennis McCarthy, and he commented, I felt it was important to interpret the grief that the Voyager crew felt in the episode when their hopes were dashed after finding that tiny wormhole. I really played that one much stronger than I would have played a show three years ago. In the end, everybody agreed that the score really helped the show. And uh, yeah, I noticed that a lot, the melancholy sort of main theme when they send Ramor back or the victorious music when they first beam him over. I, it was very, it stood out, but not in a bad way. I was like, this is actually a very well done score for the episode. But with that out of the way then, uh, before we jump in and give our favourite character moment in line, I'm going to go to the audience and in this case, critics response, because we have been getting quite a lot of audience response for every other episode this season, but for some reason this one just didn't seem to quite resonate with people in the same way, so I don't have a lot of audience response. But I was really interested to learn the way that uh, the critics responded to this one. Incoming transmission. Um, out of the 16 episodes in the first season of Voyager, aired in early 1995, Eye of the Needle tied with Caretaker for the highest rated episode on TV.com as of 2018. Both episodes had a rating of 8.7, surpassing the next closest, which was State of Flux, with a rating of 8.5. Uh, in 2016, Vox rated this as one of the top 25 essential episodes of all Star Trek. Wow. 
Uh, in 2017, Den of Geek ranked the actor Vaughn Armstrong as the fifth best guest star on Voyager, uh, for as well as Telek Ramore. In 2019, Screen Rank ranked, ranked Telek Ramore as the number one most important Romulan of the Trek franchise. Mm, yeah, I don't know about that. I quite, uh, I, I quite think the uh, Romulan Commander and Balance of Terror is a bit important, but okay. Um, in 2020, Sci-Fi Wire ranked Eye of the Needle the 14th best episode of Voyager. They note the crew was able to make contact with a ship in the Alpha Quadrant, but there's a plot twist. Also in 2020, Gizmodo, Gizmodo listed the episode as one of the must-watch episodes from season one of the show. Uh, in 2020, again, the Digital Fix said it was the best episode in season one and praised Vaughn Armstrong's acting. They felt the episode connected the audience with feelings of loss that the crew were feeling by being lost in space, not the TV show. Um, in 2020, Tor.com gave the episode 9 out of 10 and again praised Vaughn Armstrong, who they said delivered a rounded, complex, fascinating character. But they also praised Mulgrew and Dawson's scenes, which again, I kind of have to agree with. So yeah, that was the critics. I'm going to jump over to the little bit of um, audience interaction that we do have. So thanks if you did sort of contribute your thoughts for this. Uh, over on X at Retro Center said, I think teasing the audience with a way back to the Alpha Quadrant when the show had only been airing for a month was a waste that only leads to a bitter disappointment. It's not a bad show, but they should have been saved for later. So somebody Agreed. that's agreeing with you there. <laughs> yeah. um, on my personal Facebook, Tyler Weddle says, it's a hit, but on the lower end, Voyager gets their hopes up, then gets a huge letdown. They leave a message for friends and family, but we never know if that message is sent because the Romulan commander dies. No change to status quo, but the tweak to the usual time travel style is novel. Nothing much stands out about the acting, direction, effects, or plot. Otherwise, it's a mostly bottle show. Okay. Uh, from the Facebook group Star Trek Fans British Isles, Jim Goff simply says 3.5 out of 5 for me. Okay. Uh, from Trek Twitter Refugees on Facebook, Edmund Pollock says 5 out of 5. It's my favorite episode of season one, one of my favorites of the show, and a top tier Vaughn Armstrong guest character. So, yeah, different uh, sides of the spectrum on that one. And finally, from the Star Trek Ships of the Line Facebook group, we have a few here. David Peach Hill says this is one of the better Voyager episodes, 4 out of 5. Camrose Chowdhury agrees and says it's yeah, especially for season one as well. Uh, Jeremy Avery says wonderful episode shows Romulans can be wonderful people. Time traveling antics, Vaughn Armstrong is wonderful. Yeah, uh, and yeah, Camrose Chowdhury again says the added twist of the time differential threw me for a loop. So yeah, that's all of the kind of feedback I have from audience or critics on this episode. So. Uh, I'm going to jump in and ask for our favourite character moment and line, as I always do from the episode. So, again, uh, we have a first-time guest here, so Justin, I'm going to come to you first and ask, first of all, who was your favourite character in this episode? Oh, um, yeah, it had to be the Doctor, absolutely. Cool, uh, I, good call. I would say that it, that, that uh, subplot eclipsed the main episode for me. Oh, I can understand you saying that for sure. Definitely, I can't, uh, I can't counter that too hard. So yeah, fair enough. What about you, Alison? Who was your favorite character? Mm -hmm. um, oh, it's a toss-up between um, Telek Ramor and the Doctor. Mm. I love the Doctor. The Doctor is one of my favorites. Um, I would say, I mean, he had he always has great quips, but I really liked the. Um, I liked how Vaughn Armstrong portrayed for more. Um, I don't know. He just seemed to have this element of compassion and he wanted to help them. And yeah, that was refreshing and needed in this episode. Cool. Another great choice. Again, can't really argue. Uh, but yeah, I went with Jamie. I think uh, that for me, I think she's my favorite character because just of the way that she goes through the gamut and the way that Kate Mulgrew, as we've said, portrays all of the various different emotions she has to go through in this episode. Uh, so yeah, that was my choice. Uh, so uh, back around then, what was your favorite moment or scene in the episode, Justin? Uh, let's just say I've become accustomed to being treated like a hypo spray. That was mine. <laughs> <laughs> I, that was similarly, I said my favorite scene was yeah, Janeway's conversation with the doctor. Because <laughs> I love that she shows the empathy and like realizes, you know, he, he deserves his urgency in that scene. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think we're basically all in agreement with that one. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I would so, actually go for a, a, another favorite, though. I, I did enjoy at the end, just when Tuvok was like, okay, I'm going to now kill everybody's hope for the future. 
Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I should have said that was the one bit of feedback I didn't read out because I did get feedback from uh, from Adrienne, our regular guest on the Discord group. But her feedback was simply stupid. Tuvok always asking date this and time that. <laughs> well, he kind of had to. It is his job, you know. He's the science officer. <laughs> I will. I will give one more moment. Um, I like it. It's the very end. It's the last one. Um, the doctor says there's one more request. Something of a personal nature. I would like. A name. See, I, I don't like that because I think it's just now that we know he never gets one, it's really hollow. I know, yeah, but you it's... don't know that when you first. <laughs> At the time, it. I'm sure it was great, but I feel like now it's kind of as the big hook that ends the episode. It sort of sucks because it doesn't. We know it doesn't go anywhere, and I I don't blame them because the initial in, idea was that he was going to come to the name Lewis Zimmerman. That's how he's even listed in the show bible. Um, why they changed their mind, I don't know, but yeah, <laughs> so. Anyway, I, uh, uh, I, I, same as what you said there. Like it was, it was really. If it had been the first time I'd watched it, it would have been a great line. But knowing the yeah. payoff, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, a bit redundant, but uh, cool. So yeah, uh, what about specific lines then? Does that, you have anything else, Justin? Or was it what you already said for us? Oh uh, no, it was uh, definitely what I said there. Um, my other cool. favorite was uh, the the Harry Kim wormhole line from Tom Paris. But uh, nice, cool, yeah. Uh, Alison, what about you? Yeah, it was the hypo spray one, being treated like a hypo spray. Fair enough. Mine was, uh, I've already kind of mentioned how much I liked it, but it was Janeway's kind of speech to Ramor, trying to kind of, uh, you know, manipulate maybe, but get engender his empathy. Uh, and I've got it written, which was just, Captain, every one of us on the ship has left behind friends, family, loved ones. We may not see them again for years, maybe never. So we can all understand how lonely you must be. Surely you must understand our feelings as well. We would be deeply grateful for any efforts you might make to persuade your government to send our messages. Aw. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, as I've been doing this series, then I've been kind of asking, what do you think the overall message was in the episode? Sometimes it's easier than others, but uh, do you guys have anything that you wanted to shout out that you thought was the overall takeaway? Uh, Justin, I'll ask you first. Uh, the overriding message of the episode, that uh, despite whatever happens, you have to keep carrying on, I guess would mm. be yeah. what I took from it. Yeah, I can't disagree with that. Yeah, what about you, Alison? Anything that you wanted to, to think of it's trying to say? Similar, um, just having hope. Um, mm. I think overall, you know, yes, they feel let down, but they keep persevering. So they're holding on to that hope that, um, and I think that's ultimately what gets them home sooner because if they wouldn't mm. have tried so hard throughout all those seven seasons, they might not have come across the ways that they were able to finally get home. Um, yeah. And I also think the doctor, he has some hope at the end too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a hope that he can be treated differently. He's been, he's been treated differently by two different people and he sees like a, Hmm, like maybe there is more for me. So. Yeah, I agree. I, I said more or less the same thing. The exact message I have written is that I think it's saying travel, hopefully, and always treat others with kindness and respect. <laughs> yeah. simple as that really uh cool so before we get to our conclusion and score then and uh, then wrap things up i did promise you a limerick <laughs> so <laughs> as i scroll up in my notes i can't put it off any longer uh so yes the limerick that sums up eye of the needle which i was working on for far too long and hopefully you don't uh, you don't hate <clears throat> here goes uh our salvation turns out to be pants what is this? A wormhole for ants? But the Romulan guy says at least that he'll try to send help for us, given the chance. <laughs> That's cute. Bravo. Bravo. Thank That's you. Thank you. I like it. <laughs> Anytime I can ch chuck in a Zoolander reference, it's a plus for me. So, yeah. Oh, Zoolander. <laughs> So, yeah, all that remains then is for us to give our conclusion and our score out of five Starfleet Deltas. Uh, Justin, are you happy to go first, or would you rather have a bit of time? Uh, no, I could probably go first. Um, go so you want the conclusion first? Uh, uh, yeah, conclusion, and then just finish up with your score out of five. Okay, uh, my conclusion is I, I thought it was a, a pretty thoughtful episode. Um, it raised some pretty interesting themes, uh, both for the, the subplot and the main plot. Um, it was really nice to see Janeway doing some just stellar acting, um, as, well, as well as the Doctor, uh, and yes, the guest star, of course. Um, 
uh, it raised a lot of issues for me as far as like back end on time travel and such, but that's it's not addressed in the episode, um, which a lot of the time travel episodes do uh, when you really start thinking about them. So, no, uh, I I'd, uh, I'd give it four, four out of five deltas. Okay, cool. Uh, Allison, are you happy to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, my conclusions. I love this episode. Um, I it's kind of just what I've already said. I think they do a good job. Um, I think this kind of sets you up to see how their um, adventures are going to be. You know, that they're going to consistently be looking to find ways to go home. And despite their disappointments, they're going to keep on trucking um, yeah. because that's what they've got to do. You know, they, like what else are they going to do? They're either going to take 70 years or whatever or 90, whatever it is. Or, you know, along that path, they can attempt other ways to get home sooner. I mean, that's yeah. really all they can do. And then also, as you were saying about being kind, do some good along the way, the Star Trek yeah. way. You know, mm -hmm. um, that should be the motto of Voyager. But um and I also like that, was it was it Chicote that said something about, um, like, if he gave his um, message when he first got back and tell, to tell them not, to tell Starfleet not to send Voyager on the mission? Yeah. He said, we've already done so much good over here, the consequences would be, or we've already done so much and affected so many species and things like that, that the consequences um would be huge, yeah, because they've already made an impact in the Delta Quadrant. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. I like that. I feel like, once again, it's kind of showing that that selfless, selflessness, like how Janeway had to make that choice, even though, you know, when they got sucked into the array and all that. So mm -hmm. um, I'm going to give it a four, a four out of five also. Wow, okay, that's fair enough. Uh, so yeah, my conclusion, again, apologies if it's a bit long when I always like it written down. Uh, I just said it's this is a slow episode by modern standards, but it's one that perfectly encapsula encapsulates Voyager's key themes of family, both found in biological, loneliness, a longing for home, and the brilliant Star Trek message to treat people with respect and an open mind. Personally, I think the early presence of the episode actually helps to drive home the stakes of Voyager's displacement by basing this plot around it and showing the effects it's already having on the crew. The first time I saw this, I remember being impressed but exasperated with the various twists. And while their impact is naturally dulled on rewatching, I still think it's brilliantly written the way that the plot unravels. I adore the Doctor's subplot here. Yes, it's territory we've covered, notably in TNG's Measure of a Man, but it's an important evergreen statement that deserves reiterating. And the acting by Picardo, Mulgrew and Leon really makes it worthwhile as well. If I'm being critical, there's a little too much sense of dragging along on the initial contract with Ramor and a whole exposition scene in Janeway's quarters that came across unnecessary and clunky. Uh, there's also some far too swift disregarding of potential to just beam back in time 20 years. Heck, in first contact, Picard and his crew were going to settle centuries in the past. Uh, yeah, this episode may not be for everyone. There's no real dynamic action sequences or truly huge dramatic moments, but it's solid Star Trek doing what I watch the shows for. And I also gave it four out of five, unbelievably enough. So, I mean, working out the average isn't going to be difficult. We got four, four, four. So, yeah, the final score for Voyager's Eye of a Needle would be four out of five. <laughs> Can't disagree with that. So that's going to wrap us up for this week. And as I said, for another few weeks in the, in the Trek podcast world, we'll be back, as I said, in three weeks' time. Well, I said anything you wanted to shout out? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, you can find me on Instagram as Ali Who Trek, A L L I Who Trek. Um, still working on my book. That should be done soon. I have people editing it now for me, giving me feedback. Um, my hope is in April to have it out. So, yeah, that's that. Cool. And remind us, what was your book about again, sir? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. It's a guided journal. Um, so it's guided journal prompts based on Maslow, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So if you think about the pyramid of needs from physiological needs up to self-actualization and transcendence, it's um, uh, a theory that he created based on the power of motivation. So um, basically, I'm creating this um, guided journal to help people recognize like unmet and met needs in their life whether that was in childhood, currently, things like that, and how they can work on getting those needs met to help them move and move and grow personally. 
that's awesome. Yeah, you are far too intelligent for this little Trek podcast. <laughs> but yeah, Didn't look forward to having you. Giants, jeez. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look forward to reviewing some more Star Trek and movies with you as well as as the year goes on. And uh, yeah, awesome. It's great. Uh, it's been a great episode. I've enjoyed uh, talking to both of you. And you can catch us in all the usual places. Hopefully, there'll be a graphic on screen as I edit. Uh, we're on YouTubers Hit or Miss Star Trek on Spotify or wherever you get podcasts as Silver Screen Podcasts slash Hit or Miss Star Trek Podcasts. We're the Hit or Miss Star Trek Facebook group. We are HOM Star Trek Podcast on Instagram, at HOM Trek at mstn.social on Mastodon. Uh, on threads, it's just me personally. I am at michael.k.wilson. On Blue Sky, we are at mikepods.bsky.social. And on the artist formerly known as Twitter, we are at Trek Screen Pods with a capital T, S, and P. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, as usual, if you wanted to get in touch with us, you know, you can uh, drop us a line anywhere uh, on the places I mentioned. And if you want to be a guest, feel free to put yourself forward. Uh, that's, that's what these two did. And we ended up, uh, you know, having great guests and great conversations out of it. So, yeah, um, we'll be back. And in the meantime, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's been listening so far. Hopefully you've been enjoying it. And do remember, we are Starfleet. Live long and prosper. <laughs> Live long and prosper. You have been listening to the Hit or Miss Star Trek podcast, hosted by Michael Wilson and DK. Produced and edited by Mike Wilson. Additional material by DK. Please remember to like this episode and spread it throughout subspace. Subscribe to the Hit or Miss YouTube channel and follow us online. Links to all of our social media pages can be found via the link tree listed in the episode's description. For any queries or to apply to be a guest on the show, you can also email HOMStarTrek at gmail.com. This podcast is part of the Mike's Podcasts Network. You can listen to this and our sister podcasts on all good podcast providers by searching for Mike's Podcasts. Hit or Miss Podcast was based on an idea by Michael Wilson and Will Templer. Thank you for joining us. We hope you'll be back, but for now, hailing frequencies closed. I'm gonna walk out of here at once, maximum speed.